Good evening, my name is Kenetta Hammond Perry and I serve as director of the Stephen Lawrence Research Center here at De Montfort University in Leicester. I'd like to welcome you to this final episode of our webinar series, Unsettled Multiculturalism's 2020 Transruptions in a Time of Racist Calamities. Over the last few weeks, this series has curated a set of evocative conversations that have taken Barner Hesse's groundbreaking edited collection published in 2000, unsettled multiculturalisms as a starting point for thinking about our current historical conjuncture. It's genealogies. We're thinking about the conditions of living and rendering death in this moment and this moment's possibilities for ushering in revolutionary and radically different futures. And one of the chapters written by uh, Barnard Hesse in that book, he urges us to remain persistent in considering what he describes as the transruptive politics of Black unsettlement and settlement. Moreover, in our analysis of Black Britain's post-colonial formations, he insists that we seek to account for the ways in which Blackness in Britain is constituted by differential investments in the nation that are often articulated regionally through histories and memories that are often connected to cities and local geographies. Tonight, our panelists will consider the theme of regional transnational blackness. We are honored to be joined by Dr. Pat Noxolo, who is a senior lecturer in human geography at the University of Birmingham. Pat is a nationally renowned thinker in the area of black geographies and spatialities. Her work brings together the study of international development, culture, and insecurity, and uses post-colonial, discursive, and literary approaches to explore a range of Caribbean and British cultural practices. Pat Solo will be joining us tonight both as a panelist and a guest moderator for the panel later in the discussion. Additionally, tonight we also have um, Professor Mark Christian, Dr. Christian is a full and tenured professor at Lehman College, City University in New York in the Department of Africana Studies. He was born and grew up in Liverpool and educated in the UK and the US. His scholarly interests are interdisciplinary within the context of Africana Studies and historical sociology. And he has a number of publications, including books um, entitled Black Identity in the 20th Century, Expressions of the UK, and the U.S. African Diaspora, and most recently, Booker T. Washington, A Life in American History. We're also joined tonight by Dr. Sean Sobers. Dr. Sobers is an Associate Professor of Cultural Interdisciplinary Practice at the University of, the West, in, of, of West of England in Bristol. He works as a visual anthropologist, primarily in the mediums of filmmaking, photography, and text. Topics of his work are wide ranging, including legacies of slavery in the UK, the African presence in Georgian and Victorian Britain, Ethiopian connections with the city of Bath, Rastafari language and culture, and black cultural history. Next, we also have on our panel tonight, Carol Leeming. Carol Leeming was awarded an MBE as a poet, playwright, and contributor uh, to, to, Lester's art, to Lester Arts and Culture. She's also a singer, songwriter, musician, composer, actor, director, curator, visual artist, and publisher. And I also have to thank Carol again for the wonderful contribution of the music and the poetry that she added to our first um, session of Unsettled Multiculturalisms and, and the music that you hear in the intro and, and outro of the series. So we're very grateful for um, your, your work um, and, and sharing uh, your, your, your cultural work with the series more broadly throughout um, the, the entire program. She's had a number of publications in anthologies, including Women, Black Arts, 
and Brixton in the 1980s, and she's a social activist for African diasporic art and culture, Africology, decolonizing curriculums, women's rights, and equalities. Chris Zimba is a lecturer in history here at De Montfort University as well. His research interests include colonial and post-colonial histories and the African diaspora. He's published a book titled Zimbabwean Communities in Britain, Imperial and Post-Colonial Identities and Legacies. And Chris has also been involved in organizing the 2015 History Matters Conference, which was a really important and groundbreaking conference aimed at exploring why there are few history students of African or Caribbean heritage in British education uh, traditions, in British education institutions. And he's leading a lot of that work um, here in the city of Leicester and in the broader East Midlands as well. Our last panelist is Dr. Francesca Savande, who is a lecturer in digital media studies and director of the BA in Media, Journalism and Culture program at Cardiff University. She is the author of The Digital Lives of Black Women in Britain, which was recently published by Palgrave in 2020. And along with Professor Akugo Imajulu, she's the co-editor of To Exist is to Resist, Black Feminism in Europe. I am really pleased to welcome our panelists this evening, and I will turn first to Dr. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I, I am. I'm having a slight nightmare with my Wi-Fi, so I, I hope you can hear me okay, and I hope I'll be all right for the seven minutes that I'm on, on full. So um, I want to thank Kaneta and Lisa and all of the team uh, for inviting me. Uh, I've been looking forward to this, uh, a chance to have a, some intellectual conversation. So um, I hope uh, this will be an enjoyable evening for all of you. So what I want to talk about today, I've entitled it Decolonial Churn and the Everyday Remaking of the Unsettled City. So I'm coming at this as a cultural geographer. So I think about culture and space and how they interrelate. So in this talk, I want to think about cities, drawing on urban theory and the spatial patterning that constitutes or makes the city, both from within its internal geographies and from without its external geographies. The key idea that I want to talk about is that cities are constantly on the move, and that multiculturalism or racialized embodiment is one of the forces that constitutes the British city. I'm relating particularly to Birmingham, which was where, was where I was born, where I grew up, and where I live and work now. And I want to reference two texts primarily, Barna Hesse's paper, Multicultural Transruptions, and my own paper, Flat Out Dancing the City. But I have also been asking similar questions in some of my other work, for example, the introduction to a special issue on urban roots to creative black culture, which is called Towards a Black British Geography. So I wanna make three points in this paper and it's in three parts. Firstly, no British city stands alone. Secondly, each British city is deeply multicultural in its own way. And third, uh, I want to talk about decolonial churn. So I want to start by thinking about the British city. No British city stands alone. The city is a dynamic place. The key ideas for me that I'm interested in are mobility, motion and matter. So I'm interested in how people, goods, services, building materials, waste, water, resources, etc., how everything moves in and through the city and how they constitute the city as they move. So out of this interest in movement and its materialities, by which I mean different forms of the tangible, for example, flesh, skin or stones, um, out of that comes the idea that the city can be understood as a vortex. So I want you to think about, for example, a water-based tornado, as in when you, you know, a plug hole. So there are centripetal forces in the city, business, economics, community relationships, retail, employment opportunities and transport, for example, and they exert an inward pull, centripetal force, which creates Birmingham through a number of transactions within it. At the same time, there is also a centrifugal force which flings outwards from the city. For example, money that migrants make in the city changes the landscape of many other places via remittances or money that people send to their families elsewhere. So at the same time, there's inward, there's outward, and then there's upward push where the city creates opportunities. And there's also a downward push where austerity and other forms of discrimination and disadvantage push people into need within the city. So all of these forces, centripetal 
fetal centrifugal, inward, outward, upward and downward, have been constantly producing and reproducing Birmingham at least since the Industrial Revolution. During the British Empire, Birmingham was an important hub, not only for people traveling inwards and outwards across the imperial space, but also as an important manufacturer of guns, for example. So Birmingham has played its part in the demand for raw materials that shaped so many people's lives across Africa, the Americas and Asia, but also it's played its part in the circulation of violent authority and control in the many parts of the world that were colonised to produce those raw materials. So Birmingham's current multicultural culturalism is not accidental and it's not innocent. It comes out of a transnational post-colonial history of flow, connection and power. So I would want to assert that you can't get a clear sense of what constitutes any British city without understanding three things. It's internal geographies, what happens within it. It's external geographies, the range of people and places around the world that connect with it and flow through it, and the flows and forces that constantly reproduce the interrelationships between its internal and its external geographies. So every British city is multicultural in its own way. Having established a broad sense of constant movement and of forces, the idea of each city as a vortex that's connected with other cities, I want to nuance that a bit by thinking about counter forces and resistances. Each city has its own traditions and continuities, its own banal practices of placemaking that cut across and pull against the large scale centripetal and centrifugal forces that connect cities one to another. This is a kind of counterforce that is intermittent, non-linear, never enough to stop the vortex, but it's a counterforce that itself is never extinguished. It's the counterforce, if you like, that makes the vortex shudder and dance. Now, dance is one way of thinking about the specificity of each city. To live in a city is to learn how to move through it, to learn what David Seaman has called its place ballet. So the particular layout of its streets, its architecture, its community arrangements, et cetera, et cetera, all of this shapes the everyday forms of embodied movement that each urban space makes possible. And place ballets are different in each city. There's a choreography to place ballets in each city, each has its own choreography. And that's a mix of the cultural norms from which acceptable and unacceptable movement is derived, and also the diverse transnational connections between cities. So this everyday rhythm shaped by the built environment is, I think, the material form of what Hess describes as vernacular multiculturalism and what Gilroy describes as conviviality. It's a vision of the city, of living together, that Barbar describes as the scraps, patches and rags of day daily life. It's not often talked about until it shapes itself into some form of protest, but it's usually just lived. And as Hess points out, the very presence of this lived or vernacular multiculturalism that I am arguing constructs the British city in a material way is a transruption in Hess's terms. It cuts across, undermines and disrupts what Hess describes as statist multiculturalism. The persistent and obviously false idea, obvious to those of us who actually live in British cities, that black communities have always just arrived, that race is a problem, and that the British city was ever simply white. I'm going to need to kind of finish there and not really think too much about decolonial churn, but the idea of decolonial churn is this queasy idea that each city is trying to come to terms with its colonial past. And Diversely racialized people can get lost in that, in the urban vortex, within this decolonial churn, spinning with economic forces out of their control. But at the same time, what I really want to emphasize is that black, brown and white people, through our banal movement in and through the city, have an everyday embodied agency with which we too construct Birmingham as a multicultural city. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. That. I think that's a, a really great framing to begin this conversation. And I definitely am hoping that we can actually unpack the notion of, of decolonial churn. I think that's a, a really, that notion of churning is a really incredible sort of way to, to think about people moving and living and embodying the space of the city and making and constituting the space of, of, of the city. So thank you for that. I'm going to turn next to, um, to uh, Mark Christian. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Lisa Palmer and the team for inviting me. It's nice to be part of a Black British panel for a change. I'd like to also pay respect 
to Doreen and Neville Lawrence for without their tenacity to fight for social justice, we may not have conducted this panel via the research center. I'd also like to dedicate my presentation to both Stephen Lawrence, who would have been 46 years of age had he not been murdered by racist thugs, and also my city, we, we have our own uh, Anthony Walker, who was hit with an ice pick in his head, walking his girlfriend to the bus stop in Heighton, Liverpool in 2005. So respect to those, Anthony would have been 34 years of age. Both Stephen and Anthony were 18 years of age when they were assassinated or murdered or you know whatever way you wanna consider it. This is my next point is about Britain itself and white Britishness. I think when we get together as so-called cultural minorities to speak about race, racism, ethnicity, whiteness tends to go to the, to the borders and we consider ourselves and we fragment ourselves to the point that you know, we don't know who we are sometimes when we walk away from, from it. White Britain itself is multicultural. It's made up of Celts, Anglo-Saxons, Danes, Jutes, you know, uh, Romans, Normans, just to name a few. They amalgamated into this so-called white British heritage, but they are, if you go back in time, a very multicultural group themselves. If you add in Peter Fryer's uh, analysis of the African legionnaires that came with the Romans, you also have an integrated spice of Africanness within the ancient British history as well, which is not much talked about. There must have also been a lot of black presence in the 1600s because Queen um, Elizabeth I said, there's too many blackamoors in the realm. And she, you know, issued a proclamation to get black people out of Britain in the early 17th century. Strangely enough, sticking with the royals, we have to go to Queen Charlotte, who uh, comes out of the Portuguese royal lineage and marries King George III. And Queen Charlotte is the great, 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 great granddaughter, um, the great, great grand granddaughter is Elizabeth, uh, Queen Elizabeth II today. So that was a bit of a mouthful. Let me say that again. I'm trying to stay within seven minutes. <laughs> Not easy. Great, 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 great granddaughter is Queen Elizabeth. Therefore, Meghan Markle and the Queen have quite a lot in common racially, if you think about it. My next point is to talk about the colonizer and the colonized. I think we're also in that framework when we speak about race and racism in the British context. I wanna use Thatcher as the colonizer speaker, and then I wanna use Barna Hesse as the colonized, uh, the word, the defender, if you like, or the one who responds to the colonizer. This is just for simplicity. Thatcher said in a speech to Europeans, this is when they were moving towards the European Union back in 1988. She says these words in a speech in Belgium. Too often, the history of Europe is described as a series of interminable wars and quarrels. Yet from our perspective today, surely what strikes us most is our common experience. For instance, the story of how Europeans explored and colonized, and yes, without apology, civilized much of the world, is an extraordinary tale of talent, skill, and courage. Quote, closed. Margaret Thatcher, September 20th, 1988. Hesse, up to date, 21, 2021. He says the settling of black and brown people into Britain from colonial and post-colonial eras continues to disrupt the white hegemonic discourse that consider all to be settled. If you consider Thatcher, 
she has a settled view. Well, she had a settled view back in 1988 about, and she's proud of the colonizers' perspective. It draws the Europeans together as one common group, even though she was against the European Union in many ways. What strikes me about that citation, if the colonized were uncivilized, why does the British Museum, for example, hold such lucrative cultured artifacts stolen from colonized regions? Uncivilized people don't produce such cultural artifacts. And anybody walking through the British Museum or a, or a Parisian museum or a museum in, even in North America will find artifacts that are highly cultured for their time and place. That's not an uncivilized group of people producing those artifacts. Just a point to think about, about the dis misinformation, if you like, of that heritage. Also, white British, I'd say, as I said earlier, it's not pure or unsullied, but made up of many cultural groups long before the arrival of black and brown colonial and post-colonial communities. I go now to my city, the city of Liverpool, where I was born and raised. It's whenever I read the history, it's the oldest European black settlement um, going back 1730s. Peter Fryer again argues that Liverpool was an insignificant seaport until it got involved in the transatlantic slave uh, trade. And it built itself up, business, commerce, everything was built up through the slave trade and the trade in, in African souls, if you like, the development of plantations, the development of raw materials. We are, in fact, as we come up to the 20th century, 21st century as well, we are descendants, people of color, if you like, if for a simple term, of that history. And the black settlement in Liverpool, as the previous professor talked about cities, Cities are based also on economic uh, opportunity. And in the latter part of the, uh, the mid 20th century going forward, Liverpool began to wane as a, as a seaport economically. And the, the more difficult it became, the more difficult it was for the black community. There was riots, anti-black riots back in 1919, 1948, 1972. In 1971, we have the urban uprisings, which are racialized, but also some elements of economic um, play for the white working class as well. There was also um, disturbances in 85, and I think in 2000, 2011, um, but don't quote me on that. I believe there were. Overall, the Liverpool City Council uh, apologized in 1999 for its role in the enslavement process. And I have a minute to tidy up things here. So I would say this in short, Britain itself is a multicultural nation and always has been. It's the browning, if you like, input from the, from the world wars. My father came in 1941 as a skilled technician and he worked in the munitions factory during World War II as one of those Jamaicans who came over. And he ended up, he was a skilled technician, and he ended up in a factory. So, so you can see the, the, uh, the arc of the universe didn't bend toward justice for him. My father, Gladstone Forbes Christian, who was a cricketer who played with Larry Constantine in Liverpool during World War II as well. I'd like to then, I, I, I'd like to say far more, but this seven minutes is just too, too restrictive for me, it's linear. So I'll just, I'll leave it there and come back during the question and answer period. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mark, for that. And we we will have um, some time to unpack uh, some of the, the comments in the in the discussion. But I definitely appreciate sort of the ways in which you sort of provided some some historical anchors there, and sort of how we think about the histories that we tell, also through this lens of the cityscapes and space and locality. So I think there's there's definitely a lot to unpack there, um, particularly in relation to that framing that that Pat gave us as well from the mm -hmm. outset. I'm going to turn to Sean Sobers now. involved in the series and the, the Stephen Lawrence Research Centre and I share the sentiments of Dr Mark Christian on his thoughts uh, regarding to Stephen Lawrence and others a uh, victim of racist violence and you know it's an honour to be on, on this platform. Um, so I'm going to be speaking today from the perspective of someone who was born and raised in the city of Bath and I'm speaking, my, the voice I'm speaking is very auto-ethnographic um, and also from the position of a methodology of small anthropology. And by small anthropology, a very personal, reflective kind of voice, rather than, I guess, overly academic. Um, and, you know, with small anthropology, with, with different events like this, I kind of respond to them in different ways. But for this one, you know, it feels just so personal to me that I wanted to just go, f go for an internal uh, reflective voice. So I hope... Uh, that is, um, you know, appropriate to the tone. Um, so I want to talk about what it's like growing up and living in the city of Bath in relation to blackness, identity, and the wider reaches of internationalism. So as I say, I was born there, I left in my early 20s to go to university, and I now live 13 miles away in Bristol. Family still live in Bath, but much, much of my, res my research is also based in Bath. So I continue to have this connection between Bath and Bristol, um, and I still feel like I live there in many ways. And, you know, Bath is a small space. Not It's not Bristol, it's not Birmingham, and many people don't even know that black people live there, you know, and that's something that I've kind of contended with my whole life. When you tell people you're from Bath, they look at you like, really? Like, how, how did you end up there, you know? Um, it's a bit like Get Out, I suppose, <laughs> in the film. Um, but there's actually a sizable black community in Bath, you know, Jamaican uh, community, Bajan community, I'm Bajan heritage myself. Um, there's a perception, I used to go to London a lot and visit family um, when I was younger with my parents. and. Often, you know, when they're referring to Bath and the Southwest, they're talking about country, going, you're going back to country. And there's the sense that Bath is a very rural place. And, you know, green spaces are not far, but it is a city, it is urban, and it, you know, it's got all the things that urban spaces have. Um, there's a perception that a space like Bath is very rich, and anyone who's from there is, has money, or it's a sense of, uh, you know, well, yeah, you might not have loads of money, but it's relative to other spaces. And actually, no, Bath has got huge areas of deprivation and some of the most deprived estates, you know, wh white working class estates even we're talking about are hugely, um, you know, deprived. And it's not about relative to, it's not like they've got, you know, big cars, but they haven't got, they got slightly smaller cars than the other estate, you know. So a lot of assumptions, uh, you know, in terms of the parochial and regional assumptions that, that come with these things. Um, you know, it's a space which absolutely has its racism. I've been thrown through windows there from someone with an accent that wasn't from Bath coming up to me when I was a teenager asking me for the time and I gave him the time and then he carried on with racist abuse and throw me through a window and I I always remember that irony of being told to go back where you came from from somewhere who wasn't from the city that I was born and raised um, and in my school one of three black people in my year one of which was my cousin but at the same time even though it was a very white space growing up I was I was brought up in a very black West Indian 
social network. My family were very connected. A lot of our parents were of the so-called Winrus generation. Um, and I kind of really admire them now for taking us to, you know, auntie this and uncle that's house at weekends, even if we didn't want to go there. Me and my sister, you know, even if we didn't want to go there, actually, I'm really thankful for that now because seeing the black family and the value of the black family dynamic is um, you know really something? So I just want to talk about some of the, I guess, the qualities that a place like Bath has in relation to the Black community um, and different things going on. So, for example, the Rainbow Steel Orchestra is the longest-running steel band in the country, which was founded by and still operates in the city of Bath. Emperor Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, lived in Bath for four years. George Bridge Tower, who was a young composer, um, he was a friend and then became an adversary of Beethoven. He performed in the assembly rooms in Bath, age 10. In 19, and this is, I should give a year, that's in 1789. Um, Ignatius Sancho, the famous enslaved African, uh, was painted by Thomas Gainsborough in Bath in 1768. But Bath at the same time, it's known as a wealthy place, but Bath is only wealthy because of the slave trade. When Bristol became prominent in the slave trade between 1723 and 1743, before that, Bath was actually quite a poor provincial town. But the work happened in Bristol in relation to the slave trade, and that made Bristol wealthy. And then they came to Bath for leisure and spent their money in Bath. So you, we still have this relationship between Bath being the kind of the, the you know the rich cousin to the to the industrial Bristol, but that relationship has its roots in the slave trade. Um, but growing up, we didn't have a sense that you know we're not in London, even though I told my parents you know at that time why didn't you stay in London? Why did you come to Bath? But now I'm older, I'm actually thankful that they stayed there because I can see the qualities. Um, uh, that, that is instilled. So I just want to talk about some of those things just finally as I'm closing. Um, one thing I have noticed that I think social media is a, is a thing for this, you know, the growing confidence the identity of black communities have who don't live in London. You know, we know that there's no such space as a utopian black space where me, my younger self, saying, why didn't we stay in London? Because there's this idea that London's got it all or New York's got it all or those kind of things. But actually, you know, we see ourselves and we see each other in our own space. And it has been argued that, you know, social media has made communities such as this more visible, but it's actually made more visible to the external eye where we have always seen each other. We've always seen each other in these spaces. Um, one thing I think it would be interesting for this discussion, growing up in such a white space, you know, I'm not phased by going into spaces which are predominantly white. We have these conversations and obviously we do need more diversity in spaces. I don't want to be the only black people anywhere. But at the same time, I've grown up in that sort of arena. So it doesn't phase me when that happens. If I'm in a, you know, a, a concert hall, I'm the, literally the only black person. So I've grown resilient to that since I was able to walk and talk. But at the same time, with these conversations and arguments now for my diversity and, you know, declosing, absolutely. It's not arguing against that, but just that psychological feeling of being in a space where I'm the only black body actually I'm, I'm 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 used to that so actually i might be on the front line of the battle fight for diversity in that context um and growing up in those spaces and now me being a filmmaker and photographer and researcher that's it it's it's actually the motivation of why i do what i do you know i use i often get labeled as someone who produces work and research around untold stories and i actually resist that um, what I say I do, I, I, I work around narratives that are unheard rather than untold. Because a lot of these narratives have been told before. All those stories I told you about George Bridge Tower, Rainbow Steel Band, as well as, you know, the black presence in Georgian and Victorian Britain, they've been told before, but no one's listening. No one's investing in those stories, getting out there to a wider audience. So I'm interested in pushing those unheard narratives to new ears. So thank you very much. 
Thank you for that, Sean. I think that was a really, I really appreciated the kind of, um, uh, you, you called it small anthropology, but the kind of ethnographic approach that you took to the paper. I think uh, one of the things that made me think about even in relation to Pat's paper is sort of, she raised that point, sort of no British city stands alone. If we think about sort of the history of what you're talking about, sort of the kind of history of the slave trade um, and, and the connections between Bristol and Bath. And also, you know, we're having this conversation about sort of thinking outside of London, but then there's, there's this question about London centric for whom, or, you know, uh, Birmingham centric for whom. And so I think, you know, that was a really powerful way to, to sort of think about how we, how we ask some of these questions about destabilizing certain kinds of spaces when we're talking about um, um, blackness in Britain. So thank you for that. I'm gonna move um, next to Carol Leeming. Uh, greetings. Thank you to everyone at the Stephen Lawrence Centre for inviting me to take part in this. And uh, yes, big respect and our thoughts to those who have gone before, who are now in the land of the ancestors um, who fell at the hands of, of racist violence. Um, this is a huge subject, so I'm just going to come straight at it as an artist who's born second generation uh, in Leicester, in the Midlands, in Britain, but partially grew up in Jamaica. My parents are from Jamaica and Antigua. So the first point I want to make is whiteness is a given and it's never questioned its origin and formation in the 17th century as to the creation of erroneous racial categories with regard to binaries i.e. blackness, whiteness. I just wanted to get that out there and I know that resonated with some of the previous uh, speakers. And in terms of transnational blackness, for me, what is absolutely crucial is oral history. How did I ever learn about an African diaspora? How did I shape my black identity? Well, I learned things about Pan-Africanism, the new Negro, Negritude, Leopold Senor to Franz Fanon, and then now, more recently, having conversations about African Renaissance and to its present more modern day form in terms of Wakanda from the Black Panther film and all that that represents in terms of transnational blackness. And also I thought about how is this happening in terms of younger generations and indeed older generations via global digital networks, you know, transnational dialogue dialogues in the wake of a global galvanizing disruptive disruptive and transruptive movements like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, self-care as a revolutionary act for black people, national, you know, natural hair movement and, and melan you know, the positivity of being melanated. All these are very interesting conversations that are happening transnationally. However, I want to sound a note of caution at this point that I think we need to be alert and avoid the dangers of the co-option, for example, by HOTEP thought leaders, for example, Dr. Uma Johnson, in terms of ideas of wokeness or black consciousness that leads to reductive ideas of sub-Saharan African essentialism that negate and erase the complexities of say, South Africa or the Car Caribbean. So for me, one of the key, key questions around transnational blackness is how do we as part of that create a new politics of solidarity, love, care and responsibility? How might this manifest this blackness for black people to confront our structure, continuing structural exclusion? And how do we confront patriarchy, white supremacy, violence, and extreme modes of extractive capitalism and climate change. In terms of black Britishness, what I considered in terms of black Britishness is, for the first point I want to make is that there has been a black historical presence in Britain that's been longer than whiteness. I'm talking about ancient times before the Roman period, for example, the archeological discoveries of Cheddar Man, African Bengal lady who was from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, right through into the pro Roman times and right through all the centuries to the present, to the present, there's always been a black present. Um, and within the national narrative, there's a sense that black Britons are temporary. And this is reinforced with narratives around wind 
Windrush and, and evidenced in terms of the hostile environment and the Windrush scandal. So I think that's an important point I wanted to make. I wanted to return briefly to oral history, how this inscribes uh, blackness in Britain and how that goes across the generations and, and echoing previous speakers in terms of those transnational links, but how that changes over time with things like demographics, the impact of regionality, culture stories. But I would also underline the importance of language, of argos, of vernaculars. Uh, and I think these are key in terms of establishing British blackness um, in terms of particular regional spaces outside of London. And we have to highlight the 1980s, not only as a, as a, a, as a site of uh, black resistance and riots, but also this flowering of artistic forms in literature, music, dance, visual arts, which gave a powerful articulation of a strong black identity, but with political messaging, unlike many black artists today, some of which who want to be free of what they perceive of a burden of black representation and or political mes messaging. And they want to be able to, you know, be free and to create new aesthetics around Afrofuturism or like myself, create devolved voices, um, equally black queer voices and narratives, all shaped in spaces outside of London. And however, they face a struggle for artistic funding and support because uh, London-centric London narratives of blackness and also on the part of black gatekeepers in the arts tend to define those projects, artistic projects that get supported. I want to move now to the growing confidence of black people outside of London. So there was actually, um, a book that was a, a poetry anthology that were that featured poets from all over England, Scotland, and Wales. And uh, I think uh, Jackie Kay, the editor, referred to those as as three separate nations: England, Scotland, and Wales. And that's an interesting idea. And basically, it was a new type of taking ownership and writing poetry about a sense of place. And this was groundbreaking because there wasn't those themes of alienation or unbelonging. There was a clear sense of ownership, a clear stake in England and in Britain and England, Scotland and Wales. So that's really interesting. I think it's also very interesting that we're hearing more devolved queer voices coming outside of London in terms of uh, na uh, narratives about black Britishness. And Manchester in particular has been very uh, active in this in terms of coming up with narratives um, from black gay communities. But I want to sort of move now to Leicester, where I'm based. And I think we may have lost um, Carol for a second there. Right. I'm back again. Okay. You were just transitioning to, to talk about Leicester, Leicester when it was all yeah. my end. That's right. So I was just going to quickly say about Leicester, and I want to position Leicester as a central site to talk about race, multiculturalism, Black Britishness, everything. I mean, the first book about Black experiences that was a big seller was written by Joan, The Unbelonging was written by Joan Riley. Both Paul Gilroy and Patiba Palmer and Avtar Bra lived and worked in the city and wrote seminal books which have been influential. We had the 1981 uh, riots and black resistance here in Leicester, but I note in national narratives, this is now excluded. We also had Ten Cantle, who was an architect of community cohesion, which informed governmental policy. We have the Stephen Lawrence Research Centre here at De Montfort University, and I will just highlight before I close, currently the establishment and the British government has been convulsed by a book which is called Green and Unpleasant Land by Dr. Corinne Fowler at Leicester University, which traces the links of our stately homes in the green, pleasant countryside, so-called, uh, and its pernicious links to slavery. And this is a, 
professional writers and young children are leading this particular project. And um, this has now been part of the momentum on the part of the government to try to close down critical race theory, to try to stop the retelling, resituating and decentering of the white hegemonic narratives about British history. British history is black history and it always has been. And, you know, it's interesting to, to look at how Leicester has always been in the center of a lot of these discourses about multiculturalism, uh, race, racism, and so forth. And I would just throw into the mix uh, intercultural, multicultural, and also Gilroy's sense of the demotic cosmopolitanism, which I sometimes see a lot of in the city of Leicester when we're talking about um, what is happening in cities in terms of this particular subject. And for me, as an artist, it's very important that we understand at this time how things are shifting in terms of the stories and the narratives that we are we are telling ourselves, and in particular, what black artists are actually putting out there. And also to understand the concept of African Renaissance is very real for older and younger generations, especially younger generations who don't feel they can get any opportunities in white Western countries. They are thinking about going to Africa Equally, there are older generations who are thinking about going to Africa, but equally there are those who wish to stay within Western countries with good Wi-Fi, of course, and be able to make uh, even better and stronger links in terms of having uh, links with the Afri African motherland. So we're living in a very, very um, uh, dread time, as we would say, but we're also living in a very interesting time in terms of the uh, discourse and the conversations of what we're having about what is blackness and in terms of the transnational uh, conversations and where we think we might want to go politically in the future. Thank you. No, thank you, Carol. That was an incredibly rich um, paper, particularly the, the points that you uh, sort of made in terms of the argument about the positioning of Lester and kind of the intellectual history of, uh, of thinking about conversations about race and blackness, um, um, both past and present. So I think that that is, is really uh, gave us a lot to think about there and, and a lot to think about the, the place of Lester in that. Um, I'm going to bring in Christopher Zimba now. Chris, your mic is off. Okay. Thanks, Kaneta. Um, and I want to thank the Stephen Lawrence uh, Research Center for inviting me to be part of what I believe is a very interesting discussion on transnational blackness. And in this conversation of um, diaspora transnational blackness, I uh, will be specifically focusing on black Africans as someone born in Africa in a former British colony, uh, Zimbabwe to be specific, and migrating 21 years ago, settling in multicultural Leicester, a city with a very strong presence of Africans. I find that this conversation is, is quite important. And um, this conversation, it needs to acknowledge that Africans are not a monolithic community, but they are. we are diverse ethnically. And unfortunately, it was this ethnic diversity that was to be exploited by imperial powers during imperialism and the annexation of Africa in the 19th century. And we also need to understand that when we are talking of Africa, I'm talking about contemporary Africa, the nations of Africa, they are a colonial construct. We have to get that in our, uh, in our mind that, you know, wherever we are saying Africa here, yeah, what are we talking about? Because Africa as it is now, it is a colonial construct. The borders were drawn at the Berlin Conference in 1884-85, which means that the slicing of Africa failed to acknowledge the pre-colonial political or social dynamics that, of course, included ethnic differences. And unfortunately, the divide and rule agenda which was implemented by the colonial powers, exploited the ethnic diversity during the colonization process and during colonial rule. And this divide and rule allowed the creation of an environment in which the uh, 
in which mistrust and ideologies of uh, ethnic prejudices were to be nurtured and blossom. And unfortunately, the colonial administrations, the reinforced boundaries and those dichotomies that were to demarcate the mental spaces of Africans that have been used to negotiate our interpersonal and community interactions, not only in the home countries where we came from, but also in the diaspora. You know, the failure to deal with um, historic uh, pre-migration memories of ethnic identities you know, have resulted in a significant number of, of Africans migrating without a mindset or willingness, willingness to engage intimately with others, with those outside their ethnic groups. And as a result, within this British multicultural context, most, I say most, yet not all, diaspora African communities have continued to coexist with limited social interactions. And of course, this is quite visible in smaller urban centers where we find that there are places which are so much you know, um, uh, composed or made up of, 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 of different communities. Now, to emphasize my point, I, I, I just want to, to look at two, two factors. You know, um, the first one is, which is quite you know, regrettable, no, the imported historic or imported historic ethnic tensions or identities have been determining, as I said earlier, on interactions with Africans, especially the first generation Africans from the same country. Okay, so you find that even within the the the, the African community from the same country, there is this evidence that interactions are restricted and they are mainly based on our ethnic identities. And of course, those identities we imported when we migrated. And this is quite evident when it comes to it can be intermarriage, you know, it, it can be discouraged between different ethnic groups. I'm talking about here in the diaspora, it can be even in religious practices. You know, find that, you know, some practices are mainly dominated by a particular group of people. Even in social gatherings, you see that ethnic uh, dimension also uh, taking place. And as a result, you find that, you know, here in the diaspora, some of the Africans community, we can say they are emergent communities because they belong or because they, 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 they are a social construct of colonialism. You know, they still see themselves through the lens of their ethnic identities and not the nation from which they came from. Okay, now, what is equally unfortunate is that our di uh, diaspora ethnic identities in our construction of who we are as blacks in the diaspora can also be understood as the tragedies of colonial rule. What happened is that, you know, after uh, independence, you find that some colonial governments, they still implemented those, uh, okay, they, rather they failed to implement radical national building policies to unite different ethnic groups. And you find that, you know, you, the governments, there is this ethnic dimension, which of course, unfortunately, has been uh, a result of that colonial divide and rule, which now is part of uh, of, of independence. The second you, uh, you shall look at is that we, we develop, I can say, uh, prejudices towards each other as Africans. Which of course is another colonial legacy. You know, we we unfortunately you find that Africans at times we, we view other blacks or other Africans, you know, as being superior or less superior than us. And unfortunately, this is a result of what happened during colonial rule, where you find that other colonial states they would develop at a faster rate as compared to others. And this was very much common in Southern Africa, where you find uh, Rhodesia, okay, that's Zimbabwe, South Africa, developed at a faster rate as compared to regional uh, other regional uh, uh, colonies. And as a result, there was a migrant labor force going to those countries, especially in Zimbabwe and also in South Africa, which unfortunately led to a situation where social hierarchies were being formed, whereby you find that those indigenous people, or rather those uh, uh, um, migrant uh, migrants, African migrants, they faced what I refer to is uh, um, insulting jokes, okay, being um, referred to as idiots. Why? Because they were seen to be coming from another colony which was less developed than, than, than theirs. And unfortunately, those prejudices have also been evident in the diaspora, where it's so unfortunate that at this age, we still laugh at each other's accents, that, you know, you speak English with uh, 
you know, with, with, with a different accent from mine, my English accent is better than yours. Why do we say this? It's because of what started in the colonial rule, uh, which we are failing to, to shake off. You know, colonial rule was all about dividing Africans. We're divided along languages, way of life. And as a result, you find that our interactions, they are shaped unfortunately with what was happening during colonial rule which is extremely unfortunate so we need to ask ourselves as blacks as africans in the diaspora those who have migrated with those unresolved conflicts or identities how are we shaping our blackness here are we shaping our blackness based on our ethnic identities and if you are it is unfortunately leading to this situation whereby there is this uh, suppression of interactions with each other and as africans we need or africa being wherever we need to honestly deal with our historical experiences that have been manipulated regrettably by the imperial powers to divide us so and this is not supposed to be superficial it has to be real most of us we still exist in our community bubbles allowing those bubbles to, to, to carry on existing bubbles which were reinforced during the time of imperial rule no, it has always been the interest of others to play black or African or ethnic groups against each other, against one another. So I think this is the time as we are constructing our blackness, not to allow ourselves to be manipulated. It's time now to stand up and say, okay, yes, we might have our differences, but it's time now to stand as blacks and say, as Africans, let's get rid of our ethnic divisions and let's strive for that unity. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chris. I, I think your, your comments really raise a, a lot of issues in terms of thinking about sort of these differential, uh, Professor Hesse talks about the differential investments in the nation, but maybe allowing us to think a bit more about the differential investments in blackness um, and, and how we sort of um, map, map some of those out and sort of think about how we can look at sort of contemporary interactions within the context of, of the African diaspora in Britain as a way to map um, the kind of legacies of colonialism and how they're continuing to, to bear an imp imprint um, in our in our contemporary landscape. So thank you very much um, for that. I'm gonna now turn to our last speaker, um, Francesca Sabande. Hi everyone. I just wanted to start by really saying a huge thank you to Lisa Canetta, to Sherilyn and to everybody involved in the Stephen Lawrence Research Center and to also echo the words that everybody has said before speaking about the different issues and topics that they're exploring. I'm well aware of the huge amount of work that has gone into making all this possible so just I wanted to express my gratitude. I'm going to try and pick up on some of what's already been discussed today and also as part of the previous sessions. And I think my starting point is really thinking through some of the differences between the notion of being black British and being black in Britain. So for me, I find it helpful when thinking through a lot of these, these questions, a lot of these themes, a lot of these topics to maybe reflect on different provocations. And something that I often find myself coming back to is remembering that we shouldn't assume a sense of nationhood, nationality or citizenship when we're speaking about the different experiences of black people in Britain. And when we're talking about the different ways that blackness is conceptualized or blackness is understood. I think that one of the points that was made, I think it was um, possibly by Carol, was thinking about whether or not we can truly speak about Britain as though it is this sort of single unified nation. And for me, I'm really interested in devolved nations. I'm somebody who was born in Scotland, spent most of my life there. I'm now based in Wales. And I'm, I'm really interested in this notion of nations within a so-called nation. So something that I, I often focus on as part of not only my own work, but as part of my experience, as part of how I live my life, is thinking about the moments when we see the history of black people in Wales, for example, or black people in Scotland being erased as part of conversations to do with Britain, to do with Britishness, and even to do with black Britishness. What does it mean to be a black person in these devolved nations whereby there are often conversations to do with colonialism and decolonialism, but which take a very different shape because of the ways that people will imply colonialism and coloniality starts and ends with the perceived um, experience of English imperialism. So within these devolved nations, we'll often see that when black people are trying to do decolonial work, they're trying to critique the ongoing impact and the existence of colonialism, the conversation is very much sort of redirected to discussion 
surrounding the internal political dynamics between the nations within Britain. And for me, we need to hold space for both conversations. Two things are going on at once. We can't imply that the different dynamics and in particular the dominance of, of England and specifically London within the context of Britain, we can't imply that notions and experiences of colonialism, which in different ways connect to English imperialism, are in any way the same at all when we're speaking about colonialism, when we're speaking about anti-blackness, when we're speaking about the harm and the violence that Britain has very much perpetuated throughout history. But what we do need to do is acknowledge what it then means to be a black person in devolved nations, trying to have these conversations um, and trying to navigate the fact that oftentimes when colonialism is mentioned, the discussion will start and end in predominantly white spaces in a way that involves just coming back to, well, how does Wales, how does Scotland relate to to England? How are these nations um, foregrounded or not in different media and political discussions? What does it mean when we see conversations to do with Britain, predominantly if not solely focusing on England, um, but then to bring it back to, to blackness, to bring it back to regional black experiences? What does it then mean for black people in these parts of the UK who find that their history, their lives, the ch specific challenges they face are really not recognised? I also wanted to make a bit of a connection to some of what's been said to do with social media, digital media, visibility. I'm really interested in issues to do with marketization, the marketplace, commodification. And I think within this landscape whereby we're looking at um, experiences of either being experiences of being a black person or, or experiences of navigating and um, being a black person in different parts of the UK, sometimes what we see going on is this myth of exceptionalism when devolved nations are discussed. So Scotland and Wales, they're sometimes referred to as being allegedly less racist than England. They're sometimes framed in a way which involves this sort of marketable notion of multiculturalism, which puts forward the inaccurate um, view that these devolved nations, they somehow are very much not implicated in, in, in the forms of colonialism and forms of anti-blackness that many black people in these parts of the UK are, are trying to address and are trying to critique. So I think within all of this, what I'm trying to grapple with when we connect that to digital media and social media, and when thinking about what everybody else has said, is I think it was Sean who mentioned the fact that people will sometimes talk about the increasing visibility of different regional black experiences, when it might be that there is more visibility in, in terms of the perceptions of people from outside of these, these places, but that doesn't mean that these, these, these people, that these histories, it doesn't mean that they have just come about. So to make a connection to the fact that I think as, as, as was mentioned, sometimes there's this implication that black people are, are temporary. There's also this notion of newness, which is very much put forward across Britain, including within um, devolved nation contexts. And I, I think when we connect this back to sort of social media and digital media and visibility, something that I'm very, very aware of is the different ways we are seeing visibility and a media marketplace representation framed as though it somehow means we are seeing some, some, some substantial changes in terms of the forms of intersecting oppression that black people face. But we know that's not the case. And I think this comes back to citizenship. And I'm, I'm going to wrap up here. I'm thinking a bit about the work of Ruha Benjamin, which explores transactional notions of citizenship. So this is when we see this clear link between consumerism and citizenship, this idea that you can only be a so-called good citizen if you are contributing to the economy. And we've seen so much of this throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, this idea that people need to go out and buy things um, to be a good citizen and to do good. And, and that's, that's why when we're speaking about media, when we're speaking about representation, when we're speaking about digital culture, and we're speaking about being black in Britain or black Britishness, the question for me will always be, whose experience of nationhood, nationality or citizenship are we, are we, are we assuming? Um, whose experiences are we perhaps referring to in ways that actually homogenize them? And how can we ensure that we avoid speaking about blackness in a way that actually contributes to the forms of commodification and, and capitalism, racial capitalism specifically, which is very much part of the, the anti-black forms of oppression that continue to, to harm black people today. I'll leave it there and I'm really looking forward to speaking more with everybody as part of the rest of the session. Thank you so much. I think that last series of questions that you asked at the very end of your, your talk, really sort of how, how are we framing these categories of, of citizenship? How are we framing and sort of thinking about 
um, certain kinds of claims to black, uh, blackness and in, 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 in particular frames and particularly where do where does the framework of, of the devolved nation sit in relation to uh, some of those assumptions and also sort of the place of the digital realm in terms of thinking about these notions of racial capitalism and 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 the ways that it that that the digital realm sort of structures and reproduces some of that. And so how can we both hold that, um, hold its possibilities, but also think about um, sort of its limits and, and be, be aware of that. So thank you for that. Um, at this point, I am going to turn to our moderator for the discussion, um, Dr. Pat Noxolo. Pat, your microphone is off. There you go. Okay, thanks. I, I'm, I'm going to be uh, quick because I think we haven't got very long for discussion and I'd really like to hear more from each of the speakers. So um, I just want to pick up on three things that have come out to me very strongly from those, um, those really interesting and varied talks. One of them is about uh, the city cities and, and um, Hesse's notion of settlement uh, and this idea that the city is both, uh, that, that we're both settled and unsettled. So I think there's been quite a lot about how British cities uh, are linked with colonialism, transnational slavery in particular, lots in there about belonging and identity uh, within particular cities. So at the, at the level of the city, the scale of the city, ideas about accent and visibility within the city and those incredible tensions of, of recognizing an accent and at the same time as you're being thrown through a window. So that those sorts of ideas of belonging and abjection. And then those sorts of range of centers of black identity, uh, what Francesca was saying at the end there about national identities and devolving identities. So the idea that it is the city, but also at the scale of the nation uh, and the scale of the UK, all of these different negotiations to be had. So that was a really interesting set of questions. The second one for me is about seeing and being seen. So what Hess, um, I think we can link this with Hess's idea of transruption, going beyond the kind of instrumental notion of blackness to something where we can actually center ourselves as seeing subjects, the ones who are seeing. So it matters what we see, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter so much whether London sees us what matters is what we see. And I thought that was an incredibly kind of strong point. These are other ideas about visibility and knowledge, telling our own stories, telling small stories, rooting our identity through the construction of black histories that are localized. So all of those are really interesting and love to unpack them more. And then finally, the idea of black identity, which of course comes up every time we talk about uh, we, we are in this kind of forum trying to reject those reductionist versions of uh, black identity, um, thinking about holding on to the complexities that we have in places like South Africa, uh, Caribbean, thought those were really interesting ideas, thinking about queer identities, for example, thinking about different nations of the UK, but trying to avoid that sort of sense of black identity as another form of branding linked with a kind of consumerist notion of citizenship, and then all these ideas around the burden of representation, taking on the kind of politics uh, of blackness. So all of these things are really interesting. I'd love to hear from the, uh, the other panelists at this point. Okay, hi, it's lovely to, to see everybody together. It's just made me, looking across everybody, I, I sort of um, started to generate all those ideas that that everybody was throwing out um i wonder whether we'd like to um talk first of, um or see whether anybody has any more that they'd like to say about the city in particular you know we've all talked about different cities um bath uh leicester birmingham um uh, liverpool uh, and you know the city is a very complex thing for us so i wonder whether there's anything that people would like to say about that carol yes i would like to, to focus on leicester which is is lauded as a great multicultural city but from my point of view it has silos i was very interested in your 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 sort of visual concept of the idea of the city and i did uh, resonate with you on that in talking about how demographics have changed. So, for example, the African Caribbean community has moved to the suburbs pretty much in in Leicester, and the changing di uh, demographics 
of that. But um, in terms of policy and the politics of the city, our multicultural branding, which is international, uh, gives a lie. It gives a lie to the lived reality in the city, and 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 also where 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 there is activity, where there is intercultural, or where we can, might actually see some evidence of, of some sort of demotic cosmopolitanism, uh, as, as as Gilroy calls it, it. This is not championed. This is not lauded because an official multicultural uh, picture is what is sold. Mm -hmm. And we like the idea of you know, sort of understanding the flows of cities that that people move from the mid from the inner city to the outer city, and then there's often a sort of sense of estates on the outer city, which then gets shifted back again. So the cities are always on the move. Sean, did you want to say something? Yeah, I'll just say like, an observation from Bristol from my time living in Bristol. You know, I, I went, I studied in South Wales, and, and, and then I moved to Bristol. Um, and what I've noticed there, and this is true for, for all cities, that the difference between the, the black communities, you know, that were born there versus black people that come into cities through university, through work, you know, and they, they're on a kind of, a, you know, that, that different relationship with the city. And often what I hear from local, you know, people that were born in, in Bristol and generations deep, that they feel Bristol's incredibly segregated and you know they won't go to certain areas in the city, and they completely don't feel welcome. And it's not something you necessarily hear from the from you know. And I'm not even really talking about class here too deep. You know what I mean? So even with community with black people that live in the same community, same streets as people that were born in the city, but they still experience the city very differently just because they've grown in other places and then moved there. And I've always find that really interesting. You yeah, know, that's how a city treated people growing up, you know, and it's, it becomes deep in the psychology that actually, even as grown, they still feels the city is not welcoming to them. When you come in from the outside, a different relationship. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that probably links with some of the points you were making, Chris, um, about the sorts of different sorts of um silos of different african diaspora um i wonder if you could say a bit more about that well it's it's, it's unfortunate that um we have migrated with strong identities in terms of ethnicity okay and that's a, that's a, that's a strong silo which i mentioned which is unfortunate and those identities they have been accompanied as well with um conflicts which would have happened before we migrated okay which can go back to history and those were the conflicts which were quite trivial at the start, uh, at the start. okay people on era but those were the conflicts which were manipulated during the colonial era and we held on to them and unfortunately it has been the case through our generations and in the diaspora it has become so evident especially in some quarters um should i give examples i think I think okay, I did a research on, on Zimbabweans. It's just, it's just there. And if you speak to those from Kenya, same thing, you know, Cameroon. So it's, it's, it's across the board. And the worst thing is that we have allowed colonial way of administration to manipulate so much that we are seeing differences, which is, which is unfortunate. And not only among Africans, even among other Blacks, those differences all are there which again can be traced back to colonialism. And that is something we need to address if we need to, 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 okay, to challenge this whiteness. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether there's there's links between the, the, the way the Home Office's hostility as well kind of um, causes some of these divisions. Um, so some of them are historical and some of them are to do with contemporary conditions perhaps. Yep. Francesca, there's, a, there's a, a question that's come in from um, Privat Goldstein, would, it would be great if you could speak on how we resist the commodification and capitalization of blackness. That's a, a really great question that I, I wish I wish had a very straightforward answer, but I think some of the things I've been thinking about, which I feel everybody sort of touched on in, in different ways, is you know those those moments when perhaps we see the visibility of 
black people being discussed, whether it's in the media or public discourse or being pushed, um, but often to imply that mere visibility alone somehow means that there is no longer anti-blackness. And I'm very conscious of the different ways we see organizations, institutions, especially since last year, and um, you know, that sort of galvanizing Black Lives Matter and black liberationist organizing. So many organizations and institutions are expressing an interest in black people or blackness um, without, without black people. And I think there are many moments whereby the opportunity to perhaps have a so-called seat at the table or be made more visible um, comes with that, that form of, of, of co-option, which Carol was speaking about. So those moments when Black people, Black history, Blackness is repackaged as equality, diversity and inclusion work um, as a way for, for organisations to seem as though they are supportive of, of Black people, to seem as though they're doing more than issuing empty statements. And I think there are many moments when Black people need to divest um, from, from certain institutions and organisations. There are many, many, many moments when visibility is the last thing um, that, that Black people need. And, and as people have been getting up throughout this conversation, I think there is this real disconnect between perceived desires for recognition um, from external organisations or, 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 or from different groups, as opposed to the, the calls that people are putting forward to dismantle anti-blackness, to, to dismantle capitalism, for these structures to be abolished, as opposed to implying this is somehow this sort of um, individual responsibility that, that people have to take on, um, and as those are somehow not connected to so many different structures, which the very institutions who are claiming to be about supporting Black Lives Matter are a part of and, and are dependent on. Sorry, nice. could I just bring in Michael? So, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, what's your name? Uh, is it Michael? Me? me? Martin. Yes, sorry, Mark. I haven't met you before. Is it Martin? Mark. 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 That's right. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's late. So um, there's a question from Michael Collins here that I just thought um, might speak a little bit to your paper, which is, was so historically informed. So Michael Collins says, the scale and permanence of migration and settlement after 1945 transforms the black presence from margins to center. Enoch Powell tried, others still try, to re-racialize England as a white community over time. But at a deeper level, the possibility of imagining England as white has been exploded. So he asks, can we embrace it, I think he means the, the possibility of imagining England as white uh, exploding in order to decenter whiteness and fully re realize the radical polyvalence, polyvalence of identity and belonging. So can we really realize the radical polyvalence of identity and belonging and start to decenter whiteness? Well, that, that's, that's up to us, you know, that's, that's up to each individual. There's diversity among us. Look at this panel, the great diversity of blackness, for want of a better phrase. But let's go to the basics, some common sense. If we were all standing in the same bus stop as Stephen Lawrence and the racists came along, I don't think they'd put half a knife in me because I've mixed heritage. They may put two knives in me because of that. But I think we'd all be attacked because of our black heritage to the vision of whiteness, yeah? So there's delusions of grandeur coming from white society always. And this idea that we cannot get it together because of the, col the colonial powers divided and conquered, we, we know that, don't we? We know that very well, that they've divided and conquered us. But what we don't want to do is carry on explaining that what is the next stage and i think bringing bringing together all these brilliant minds here for example why not have a national association for the advancement of black and asian peoples i'm just throwing that out there it could be centered in one city and chapters in different cities no different than the united states now that organization wouldn't please everybody as well but it would be one organization that could bring all this disparity, this blackness disparity together, whether you're from Wales or Scotland, Ireland, black people are everywhere. Wally Sienka, the great African Nigerian writer, said that the thing, fingertips of Africans have reached the four corners of the earth. 
he used four corners. I would say the globe, you know, and, and that's that's the natural fact. All we all roads lead us back to to um, to Africa, and even if we go to Zimbabwe, my uh, Dr. Chris, you know. It's very diverse within Zimbabwe, isn't it? There's different groups, cultural groups within Zimbabwe who argue who's best and we, we can do this and we can do that. It's the same with the African Caribbean region. My roots go back to Jamaica. And Jamaicans, when they play dominoes and they're beating each other, they say, small island, you know, to a Barbasian. So there's a difference. We've got to accept, embrace that. But we've also got to come together with, and this is not naive to have unity without uniformity. That, that should be a phrase we should all embrace. There are different dyna dynamics to our personalities. I come from a family of 13 siblings. We're not the same. We think differently, but we're from the same mother and father. You know, families have difference. Black people have difference. Mm -hmm. The nomenclature, how we speak to each other. People don't like black. People don't like Asian. You know, there's all this complexity that needs to be unpacked. And we've got to come together on something. We come together when somebody gets killed. I mean, we're here, I think, essentially because of Stephen Lawrence and Anthony Walker and George Floyd. That's why we're here. So why can't we get together with, let's not get killed anymore by the police. Let's have an organization that actually stops that happening. And then yeah. let's have better education. Let's have more black history in our schools. These yeah. are things we can come together on. Yeah, go on, my friend. I've spoken. Thank you. Carol, you've had your hand up for a while? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly affirm and support some of the points that all my other panel, you know, Mark and Francesca and Chris in particular, and also Sean. Um, very quickly, I mean, I teach black history and it's really important that we continue to teach black history because then we know, we mm -hmm. know what we're in here before white people. We know mm -hmm. that, we will know that because there's the evidence there that we were here before the Angles and the Saxons and everybody. That's the first point. I wanted to come back to Chris's point from what I've observed and seen in Leicester uh, in terms, and just underline what he said in terms of uh, we, we uh, in the African Caribbean community are starting to have a conversation about working with the different African communities because polit our political history has much value in terms of for them to navigate the current situation, particularly the newer arrivals. And I wanted to also talk to what Mark was saying. Um, I love that unity without uniformity. But again, back to social imaginaries, you know, um, this is where the oral history is important in terms of the discourses and the conversations that we have as black people as to how we can imagine new politics, how we can imagine a new blackness, if you will, in terms of transnational blackness and, and to be alert to, to, you know, some of the dangers around that. So I just wanted to affirm, you know, some of the, there's a lot of resonances there for me. Was there something you were wanting to say, Sean? Sorry. Okay. So there's a, there's a, a question from, uh, again, from Beverly Prebach Goldstein. She asked, can we talk about Leicester and other cities without looking at the intersection with South Asian communities and our historical struggles together against racism. Um, anybody would like to address that? I, I will address it because I was there, you know, in the eighties, uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder with Asian brothers and sisters up against the National Front and the police. But I would say that doesn't define black history in Leicester. Black history goes back centuries in Leicester. Um, it's just that in more recent times, because Leicester was a hub in terms of race relations industry and thinkers and policy makers and influential academics. And because Leicester has a very unique demographic in terms of um, a large Asian majority population in relation to a white population, invariably people want to talk about that. 
So I think we can talk about other things, but you know, as sort of by way of explanation, why that happens. Okay, thank you. Just there's there's a one a question here by Joe Odiambo. What is black British? Black British. It's a big question. How would you define it? This country insists on pretending to put effort into Black History Month as if we don't exist for the other 11 months of the year and Black British culture and identity, etc. But ultimately, aren't Black people Black British purely because they're Black? <laughs> Anybody want to tackle that? Sure. I'm, I'm not going to try and define it, but I will say I did a research project a few years ago. It's actually, it's kind of, it wasn't about Brexit, but it was in the kind of the months and probably the year leading up to the referendum, where I was interviewing young people about their notions of identity. It was called red, white, and you, question mark. Um, because what I was interested in was, you know, I'm, I'm 49 and I was kind of interested in my children and that generation, children's children. Do they, do they relate to Britishness and Englishness differently than I do? Do you know what I mean? Like, I've got my my values i'm a raster you know what i mean i've got my my thoughts but actually the younger generation do they think differently and should that be okay also do you know what i mean um so i was kind of interested and yeah it's interesting some of them held views that absolutely were akin with their parents and that you know they see themselves as british or black you know black british or jamaican british and then some others have said no i don't have any problem calling myself english i'm english i was born here and, you know, for my generation, and I think for many here, calling ourselves English was never a thing. Do you know what I mean? We'd be more comfortable calling ourselves British or Black British. Well, and I've always found that dichotomy kind of interesting, really. So I'm not going to try and explain it, I think it's hugely slippery and you can't kind of pin, pin that down. Um, but yeah. at the same time, you know, I was born here and I shouldn't, why should I have, why should it stick in my neck? to say that I was, I was born here, you know, I, I spent vast majority of my life here, so I am black British, and I was born in England, so I am black English as well, but that doesn't equate the fact that I'm also African, that I'm also beige, you know what I mean? By defining one thing doesn't negate everything else, you know? Oh, one one thing I also, just very quickly, is um, the, the calling ourselves black versus calling ourselves African. I think that's probably a whole other debate that is one that I think needs to get into. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's the debate within the, um, within the chat there, which is about kind of blackness outside cities in rural areas, which is a whole nother thing, which I think um, would be a great um, kind of webinar. Um, but because it's like three minutes to, to seven, um, I think it's, there might just be time. I think Kaneta's now got to... Um, Kaneta's now going to do her part of it. It says closing remarks, but I don't know whether I've got time if I start doing closing remarks with all the things that's been going on. Perhaps uh, it might last a little too long. Um, but is it Lisa who's now going to come? Yes, it's me, Pat. <laughs> I'm just um, really listening to the conversation and um, following um the conversation behind the scenes and this has been a phenomenal way to wrap up the series and and doing what it's supposed to do which is putting more questions on the table mm. um for us to pick up and um rather than offering any kind of solutions at this point i think this is an ongoing conversation and this particular episode is doing precisely what i wanted to do which is to do what barno has his paper presented to us is to offer a kind of transruption in the narrative of black British identities and to think about where we take that you know what is the focus of our direction when we're thinking about these transruptive narratives and I think um, all of you have done a brilliant job of really unraveling some of the kind of more hegemonic notions of what we think about blackness or black Britishness is and like I said before, really putting it up on the table to think about where we take this, how we take this conversation forward. So I want to thank you enormously for your intellectual labor, for your passion, for your commitment and generosity and your time. Um, for us at the center, it's been a complete honor to host you all here tonight. And it's also been a, a huge 
massive honor for us to have been able to convene this conversation across four weeks with all of the wonderful panelists and guests, um, giving us all an opportunity to really think with each other and to think together. And I think um, that has been a, a joy and a pleasure. And also to do this work in the name of the people who, have, who we've lost. Um, you know, to, to in the in the memory of the people who have lost their lives because yeah. of the violence of the ongoing violence of racism. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I commend you all for the work and the effort and the commitment that you've um, brought to the table. I just also wanted to, before we wrap up, um, I also just wanted to give a, a huge shout out to all of my colleagues behind the scenes who've worked tremendously hard over the, well, I would say over the past four weeks, but it stretches back for the past year, I would say that we've been trying to deliver this program of, of events. So I just wanted to say a huge um, sense of gratitude to Sherilyn, Sherilyn Pereira, Keely Close, Monica Barrett, Sajda Ali, Krishna Patel, Mark and Craig, as well as to um, Kaneta Hammond Perry, um, who's been who opened this conversation today and done a fantastic job of joining all of the um, the papers together and to and, and for Pat for stepping in to be this um, the discussant for tonight's episode. Um, you know, again, a huge thank you to everybody. We hope to be able to continue these conversations. We are going to be having um, some resources on our website to accompany the series, so please look out for that. And we're also planning um, some future events. Um, we've got an event coming up um, in March, um, which is a kind of community-led event, which, which will um, also uh, involve Bar Baroness Lawrence. And in April, we have another event on scholar activism. So please um, look out for our um, Twitter and social media posts and join us again in the future. And to all of the audience mem members who posted their questions, we've been engaged week by week. Um, again, a big and huge massive thank you to all of you. Um, it's been a pleasure and we're, just, I'm reluctant to say goodbye, but <laughs> um, we've run out of time. So um, good night, everybody. Have a great evening and thank yeah. you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.